Okay, uh, my name is Vaughn Allen. I'll uh, tell you a little bit about myself in just a minute. I want to make sure you can hear me and more importantly see the presentation. There are uh, a lot of things I'm going to go through here today that I hope you find interesting. Most of us know the importance of the McCormick Reaper and the first farm law tractor. But there are so many more interesting and important products developed by Cyrus McCormick Harvesting Machine Company and his son, Cyrus Jr.'s International Harvester. I will begin to highlight many of them here in this presentation today. So you've probably heard the expression the square nut division. Uh, ag was always known as the square nut division because we used square nuts. And the truck guys used to make fun of us. Uh, so anyhow, we, I thought I'd start out with that. Oops. Tom Clark is the company historian. He is in Chicago, the suburbs of Lyle. And he actually is the author of this presentation. He put this together from the archives. The archives are in Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin. Uh, there's probably about 12 million documents there and stuff from our history from before the turn of the century. Uh, I am retired from Navistar, as Dan mentioned. Actually, he said I just retired. It's hard to believe that I retired in 2013, which I think was about eight years ago. So I'm here in phase two. Now I'm looking on where it used to be. I want to make sure I have enough money to retire on now. It's like, am I going to be healthy enough to make it, right? And that's what we should all be thinking about. What can you do to keep your health? Uh, I worked in the Ag Division from 72 until 85, when the Ag Division was sold, Tenneco merged it with Case. Uh, and then I, uh, I went to uh, Navistar's Dan Mitch. Uh, so I was on the Ag Division for about 15 years and the Truck Division for 26 years, which is probably a little uncommon. Most guys that work for the National Harvester were either truck or egg. And as you know, Dan's confirming that right now. <laughs> there were a few other divisions, right? There was a construction equipment division. We bought a tough company in the 50s, built, uh, built the interstate highway system, or built the highway system. Uh, we had solar division, sold to Caterpillar in 1983, Cub Cadet Corporation still alive, and, and I'll talk to you some of that today. Uh, I live in Kansas City today. I moved from Chicago about two years ago. Moved back to Kansas City, which is where my family is from. I grew up there, my wife is from there. I have a little farm south of Kansas City, and I spend all my time there on the farm, usually clearing land and then picking ticks off my body at night, <laughs> which is not fun. My wife won't go with me anymore. Uh, the contributors to this package are several. Dan was one. Dan is a uh, Dan's old, and he knows a lot about our history. Uh, he, he is a massive collector of, of products. I don't know how many tractors he has. Over 30? I think he's got 30. Yeah, more than his wife wants him to have, I know that. Uh, Jim Allen is the co-author of The Scout, a book you may have read about the Scout business. He, he contributed. Sally Jacobs uh, manages the archives in Wisconsin, and she helps a lot, and then Laura Loeb is a digital archivist. This presentation is focused on uh, engineering developments, but not, I'm not going to go too technical uh, because you guys are all experts in your own fields. Uh, it's much more of a timeline of the product uh, introductions and events over time. It's not the complete history, but it does, and it doesn't cover every market. It covers only American, U.S. tractors. Uh, it confines tractor discussions to harvesters and American farm tractors. Uh, it should be informative and interesting, and as I mentioned, the graphics are, are just amazing. I'm going to separate this. Uh, so, uh, it, it's got the illustrations are, are really amazing. Tom Clark is a uh, graphic artist, so he's into that, and you'll see the effects of that. The demand for tractors after World War I was like nothing before. There were hundreds of tractor startups here in the U.S. trying to meet the critical demand in Europe. There are uh, four chapters to this company's history, and I'm going to talk about a fairly significant one starts today. This is a graphic of those four chapters of International Harvester. 
McCormick Harvesting Company started in Virginia in 1831 and moved to Chicago in uh, 1847, where co-founder Cyrus McCormick developed a global enterprise. His son, Cyrus Jr., merged his father's company with four of the reader makers in 1902 to form International Harvester. In 1984, under financial duress, the company sold off the ag business to Tenneco, where it became part of CNH. In a $3.7 million deal, Navistar would become part of a Trayton group, a Volkswagen subsidiary formerly known as Volkswagen Truck and Bus. Trayton SE is known as the Trayton group. Uh, they have revenue. They sell about 190,000 vehicles a year worldwide in headquarters in Munich, Germany. So you don't realize this when you came in here today, but today is the first day of Navistar International Harvester not being an independent existence. You know, we used to be on the New York Stock Exchange, it's the NAB, it used to be IH. Uh, now we're a, we're a subsidiary of Trayton. Uh, a lot of reasons for that. We, uh, in order to make money in the vehicle business, truck business, truck and engine business, you've got to have a worldwide scope. You need economies of scale that we did not enjoy by simply selling in the US, and Canada, and South America. So this change gives us that option to so that's the fourth chapter you see there that's starting today. Uh, I think it's a good thing because, and I'll show you in a minute, all the companies that you know and love of International Harvester are still here today under different umbrellas, but the effect is still there and the products are still being made. And I'll go through that today. I want to give you a little bit of history about the Reaper because that's really how it started. Starting in 1816, for the next few, uh, 15 years, Cyrus McCormick's father, Robert, a Virginia farmer, tried unsuccessfully to design a reaper. In 1831, at the age of 22, Cyrus McCormick re-engineered some of the key mechanics of his father's machine and demonstrated the first successful reaper. This event in Walnut Grove, Virginia, is acknowledged as one of the earliest events of mechanized farming. The reaper has been described as the bread machine of one half of the world. As a design engineer, John Stewart put it, the popular belief that Cyrus McCormick invented the Reaper and thus laid the foundation for the harvesting machinery industry is as deeply rooted as a child's faith in Santa Claus. Stewart, of course, was uh, with the IH merger, would become an important company engineer and contribute to many groundbreaking products. So as you know, in the original formation of International Harvester, there were two large companies, McCormick and Deering. This guy, Stewart, was one of the chief architects of products in that day. This painting depicts McCormick's first successful demonstration of the Reaper. It was done in 1931, the 100th year anniversary of the company. We are at the mercy of the painter and the company executive as to its accuracy. There are no contemporaneous notes from that day. The painting was done by illustrator N.C. White. He's the father of the famous painter Andrew White. That painting actually was in one of uh, IH's executives' homes in the 50s. The home burned down and the painting was lost. Here you can see the primitive but inventive nature of the first reaper. No motor but a ground wheel drive wheel to power the reel and cutting blade. And to keep the platform low to the ground, there were no wheels below it, just the sled pieces of wood. which is pretty amazing to consider. He made this in the early 1800s. He had a forge and a blacksmith shop. I'll show you a picture in a minute. But before the reaper, all grain was harvested by hand using some version of a sickle. The labor intensive process limited the size of the farm. Harvesting wheat, for example, is a time sensitive process. Harvesting too early or too late would be problematic. And with small labor force, the family farm was confined to only a few acres. This is the original blacksmith shop on the McCormick Farm in Virginia. Today, it's part of the McCormick Museum managed by Virginia Tech University. It's still there. You can visit it if you're ever on the East Coast or in the Virginia area. I encourage you to stop in and see it. It's in Steele's Tavern, Virginia. This is an illustration of what the McCormick Blacksmith Shop might have looked like in 1831. Rarely if ever does an invention happen in the vacuum. The reaper was no exception. Many before Cyrus attempted to engineer a reaper, some with a fair amount of success. However, it's unclear how many Cyrus might have had a chance to study. He often licensed the technology developed by others to improve his products. In 1827, a Scottish man named Patrick Bell developed a push-type reaper. 
This push configuration is not unlike the combines of today. He only built a few of these machines and he did not file for a patent. Bell was a minister and hoped his machine would benefit people everywhere. Ovid Hussey developed his reaper in 1833, two years after McCormick, and filed it for a patent before Cyrus. Hussey was McCormick's first serious challenger and initiated what became known as the Reaper Wars. Years of unsanctioned competition between the dozens of Reaper makers, two or more at a time. These infield competitions were fought with everything from bribery to machine sabotage. McCormick and Hussey first meetings were legitimate and in the end Cyrus was deemed the winner. This is a still photo of a 1931 film called Romance of the Reaper. It was done for the Hunter University of our company. It shows two people required for this operation, a driver and some of them will walk alongside the Reaper and rake the crop off the platform. It had one horse, one driver, one raker, a wooden drive wheel, a leather belt, two cast iron gears, and it would harvest 15 acres a day. There was no binding on the original machine. The picture you see at the top right is a picture of me. Uh, we had four big boxes in the basement of the world headquarters, and the facilities people called me one day, the last year I was there, before I retired, and said, Vaughn, there's, there's four boxes down here, and if we'd like you to come look at them, don't want them, we're going to throw them away. I went down and looked at it, and they were these, uh, there were 450 of these replicas made in 1931 for the anniversary of our company. And I said, well, you can't throw these away. These are, these are historical items. So I took four, and the pieces were still good enough, and, and made one from four. And it's there that you see in the picture, and it's in the lobby in the, in the Chicago suburbs of a town called Lyle, where our headquarters is. And if you go in there, you'll see that reaper on the floor. I was very nervous. I remember putting it together, and I thought to myself, you know, I had all the tools I could possibly want. No, nothing that he ever had in 1831. And I thought, if I can't put this thing together, I was really nervous, thinking what he went through, knowing nothing from scratch. And I had these pieces, and I had tools and people to help me. Uh, but anyhow, I got it. And actually, it works. It, and you know what's amazing about that item is it has a reciprocating sickle. As you all know, it's still in use today. We still use that a lot of features. Think how old that is, that technology. Uh, the reel is still used today in that concept. So some things live on forever. Uh, some of you might remember from your history classes in the 1860s, the Manifest Destiny was a popular controversial idea that European settlers were entitled to the entire continent despite the presence of Native American tribes who had been here for thousands of years. Both Lincoln and Grant rejected this concept. At the time, it was claimed that McCormick's Reaper was responsible for an additional five miles westward expansion each year. One setup in Chicago, Leander was doing double duty as plant. Leander was Cyrus's brother. Double duty as a plant manager and an engineer, he directed the next round of advancements, which included the setup for two horses, a seat for the raker, and metal rather than wooden drive wheel. And that's what you see in this picture. The next round of advancements included a seat for the driver, which was sort of nice, versus riding the horse. And an automatic self rake technology was licensed from man made. Jerem Atkins of Chicago. Four rakes that moved a kind of perky jerky motion worked surprisingly well, as you can see in the following video. It works here. This is the, the live shot in uh, Indiana. It, it in In 1858, McCormick licensed some technology from McCormick uh, McClintock Young, a self rank mechanism that was similar to the earlier version. So you remember the multiple paddles and then one came down and, and raked it off. This design was a little different. Uh, the 1862 self rank machine was yet another more successful take on the idea. A 
father and son and team in Indiana developed this idea of moving a canvas belt, we can call it a draper today, to transport the cut grain. This concept became the basis for some of the better advancements in reaper technology. The first to put this canvas belt idea in use was a guy by the name of Charles Marsh. He used the belt to deliver cut grain to a pair of workers riding on a platform where they tied it into bundles. This was the first machine to incorporate binding, and hence the term binding. Marsh was a good inventor, but not much for manufacturing and marketing. Elijah Gammon thought he saw an opportunity. Elijah Gammon, by the way, lived in Plano, Illinois. He saw an opportunity, and he bought the rights to Marsh's machine. When an old friend from Maine came to visit Gammon, he convinced William Deary, which was his old friend, to invest in the operation. Deering eventually bought and out Gammon and moved the business to Chicago. Deering would spend his years as McCormick's biggest competitor and later as a partner in International Harvester. Charles Whittington of Janesville, Wisconsin used wire and a twisting mechanism to automatically bind shins of grain. This exciting new technology was adopted quickly by McCormick and others, but was short-lived. And you all know the reason why it was short-lived. The wire twist would break off. The cows eat wire, they die. That's not a good thing. Finally, in 1881, John Appleby of Milwaukee found the answer. His twine knot would automatically bind the, the cut grain into bundles. This process gave birth to an entire industry based on twine. McCormick <coughs> and later Harvester <coughs> operated three sizes of plantations to grow raw material for twine. One of those plantations, by the way, was in Cuba. Taken over in 1959, when the takeover occurred uh, by Castro. We lost the whole property, uh, the, all the sisal fields, and the, the big, massive operation that was there. This is the twine binder in operation. And I want you to notice that, once again, there's no PTO, there's no engine, there's no motor. It's all brown steel driven, which to me is amazing. I think what's most amazing is that Tom was able to find a video from 1881. <laughs> so let's see if you're listening. Isn't that cool? It's interesting to see how many of these developments took place within 115 miles of Chicago. This was the Silicon Valley of the day. also difficult to convey the importance of McCormick's Reaper. And McCormick Reaper appears in the fresco on the dome over the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C. This was done with, the, with Abe Lincoln's approval before his death. The Roman-themed hypothesis of Washington depicts Ceres, the goddess of rain, and the blue skirt on a McCormick Reaper with the young America in the red cap. Each figure is about 18 foot tall. Others represented in the fresco include George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Samuel Morton, and Robert Fulton. The name Ceres is the real origin of the English word for cereal. I don't know how many of you do that, but if you're ever visiting Washington, go in and look at it. It'll make your heart count a little bit. It's pretty cool to think that that was placed there. It's interesting to see that farmcollector.com credits Harvester with three of the top ten inventions that changed farming. Those three are the Reaper Binder, the Auto Truck in 1907, and the General Purpose Tractor, International Harvester's Farm in 1924. The other areas of uh, creativity like that were the Cotton Gin, the Thresher by Michael Menzies, the Steam Engine, the Combine Harvester Thresher by Harvey Ford, the, gin, uh, the Gasoline Tractor by Charles Hart, Hart Car and rubber tires from Firestone, and the hydraulic implement lift with draft control, Harry Ferguson in 1934. My dad was a massive Ferguson dealer and talked forever about how profound that invention of draft control, and still in use today in almost every tractor made, the concept of draft. I won't get
get into deep into the company's business practices, but here are a few three of three innovations that helped make McCormick the success he was. He created the first product warranty in 1842, the first deferred payment program, buy now, pay later, it's still in use today. Also in 1850, he established the first global franchise dealership network, independent dealers. Even today, Navistar has the largest truck dealership network in North America. Now I want to talk about tractors. Uh, up to this point, massive steam tractors were the norm, and Case was the dominant player. This was in 1904. At the time, known as traction engines, these hulking machines did three things. They pulled heavy loads, they plowed farm fields by the way of a belt pulley, supplied power to powerless machines like threshers and grinders and so on. The word tractor comes from the Latin tactus, meaning drawn. So the primary function of a tractor is to draw a load behind, which we're still doing today with that pro star you see in that right on the right. Before building his first tractor, the company experimented with something they called auto mower. It was designed by McCormick engineer Ed Johnson. Ed Johnson was probably the preeminent engineer at International Harvest. At the World's Fair in Paris in 1900, Johnson's mower competed with Deering's and took the prize. Deering's machine stalled in the heavy grass while Johnson was able to disengage his cutting blade back up and try again. Note the triangular stance that would become the standard outline for the farm. Shortly after his success in Paris, and then despite over patents, Ed Johnston leaves International Harvester and goes to work for Keystone, an implement maker in Sterling, Illinois. Realizing the genius of Johnston, Cyrus Jr. sends him multiple letters asking him to return. When that didn't work, McCormick takes the train to Sterling and tries to persuade Johnston in person. Finally, McCormick acquires the Keystone Works and Johnston returns where he stays for more than 30 years creating some of the company's most important products. So if you can't hire him, you just buy the company and he comes with it. <laughs> Until this photo was found in the archives, we never imagined that Cyrus Jr. or maybe Ed Johnston were working on a tractor as early as 18. We had no idea experimentation had started this early. This letter from 1901 addressed to Cyrus Jr. and Harold and Stanley, both McCormick's, there were three McCormick's, Cyrus Jr., Harold and Stanley. A Mr. R.B. Swift, who we are assuming is a company employee, is writing to recommend the company work with Mr. Burson, an elderly gentleman, with ideas about attaching a steam engine to a wheel chassis known as a truck. Mr. Swift interjects that his opinion is that if the company is going to bring motors to farm tools, the resulting product must be able to do all the same work as a horse. This concept is surprisingly similar to the goal of company engineer Bert Benjamin some 23 years later as he was developing the first farm haul tractor. We have the actual letter you see pictured there from the archives. And when you see this stuff, it, it's almost emotional when you find this stuff. It's, it's real, it's the actual stuff. One day I was in the archives looking and uh, there was a book, and uh, the archive was Sally said, would you like to look at that book, Vaughn? And I said, yeah, I really would. She said, well, you have to wear gloves, because it's, you know, it's sensitive stuff. So I put the gloves on, and it was, the name of the book was The Death Journal of Cyrus McCormick. Cyrus died in 1884. And uh, in the book was a little envelope, and I opened the envelope, and it had a lot of his hair, which I assumed was a practice that they did in those uh, so she said, uh, you know, you have to be careful with that and don't touch it. But I did touch the hair and the next day I invented something. That was a joke. The archives are amazing in here in Wisconsin. It's open, you can go in, you have to set up an appointment. But there's some amazing stuff up there. The origins of the company's first production tractor go back to Mr. Samuel Stephen Morton. Morton started in 1889 building these trucks or wheel platforms, selling them to anyone, any would-be built truck builders, tractor builders. Supply your own engine was the understanding. Eventually Cyrus Jr. jumped in and purchased some of Morton's trucks. 
Ed Johnston took one of the company's famous brand engines and installed it on one of these trucks. The resulting tractor was a friction drive machine with the engine on rollers that would move to engage the clutch. This was the company's first tractor. By the way, that, there's a rep that tractor, is, you can see it in the museum, it's in the Museum of California. With a little success, the demand grew quickly. McCormick joined with Morton to build tractors at uh, Morton's Upper Sandusky, Ohio plant. Production then moved to Harvester's Ackman plant. Later, these large tractors were built at the company's Milwaukee Works and at the new tractor works in Chicago. Since all tractor development happened shortly after Harvester's merger, Deering and McCormick continued to work independently. McCormick had its mobile, and Deering had its Titan. And for the time being, the Deering dealers only sold Titans, and the McCormick dealers only sold mobiles. Yes. We have a Titan Model B, 1913. Oh, great. Titan Model B.
plow guy. With the introduction of the International 816, the mobile and tight lanes were beginning to be phased out. This model feature of a four-cylinder engine that could run on either gasoline or kerosene. It's also referred to as power fuel. In the archives, Tom discovered this unpublished history of the tractor industry written by the head of Harvester's advertising department. This book was written in reaction to a 1915 article in the Chicago newspaper praising Henry Ford's new machine for the farmer. This obviously roiled Mr. Seiforth. In his book, he goes to great lengths to document all the work done in tractor business by a number of companies, including International Harvester, long before Ford arrived on the scene. Ford's entry into the market upset the status quo. He insisted on selling his tractor below cost by market share. Harvester eventually lowered its price and threw in a plow, a deal Ford could not match since he did not manufacture implements. In a defeat, Ford moved his tractor business to Europe. In fact, there's an interesting story about this gentleman here on the right. His name is Alexander Legg. was at the Fort Wayne plant, it was a truck plant, and he got the call that Ford was selling his tractor for about seven hundred dollars, and there's a there's a dictation of their conversation where Alex Lake says, "We'll meet the price and throw in a plow," which he knew would work because Ford did not make it. This guy, Alexander Lake, was undoubtedly our most progressive. Uh, if he was still alive today, he would still be here. He was a, a major dude. On this market share chart, you can see that 1924 became the market leader, but otherwise, for the first half of the 20th century, Harvester dominated the industry. If you look at those uh, those shares, look at the 1920s, Ford had 44% of the business, which is shocking to me. I, of course, I wasn't here at the time, but uh, to think he had that, that little tractor that he sold. He's, they were popular, and they were low cost. But look what happened by 19... Uh, well, look at 1950 to 55. Deere had 14.5 percent, International Harvester had 30 percent, Ford had 19 percent. But it's a pretty amazing uh, impact. As Ford was working on the design of his Ford's tractor late in the game, he realized he didn't have any implements to sell with this tractor. Ford approached Harvester, which is amazing to me. He approached Cyrus, uh, or actually Alexander Leg, and asked for some assistance. In a move that surprised almost everyone, Alexander Legg sent one of his best engineers, Burt Benjamin, to Detroit. The speculation is that Legg wanted Benjamin to see Ford's assembly line close up. Benjamin designed a full collection of implements for the Ford system, but Ford, in the end, decided not to manufacture them. Benjamin resurrected some of these designs later when he was working on the farm model. During his years with IH, Mr. Benjamin was granted 140 patents. patents for tractors and tractor accessories, including a cotton picker, corn shredder, and corn binder. They also developed the power takeoff system. Mr. Benjamin is best known for developing the Farmall tractor, the first row crop tractor that could plow and cultivate crops. Benjamin was awarded the Cyrus Hall McCormick Gold Medal by the American Society of Agricultural Engineers in 1943. By 1923, with the release of the Model 1020, and the 1530, it became official. The mobile and type names were officially retired. A new series of tractors appeared on the scene in 1923. These machines incorporated dozens of advancements. Some of the more important features, including the world's first rear ETO, gear drive, and a unit frame single casting for strength and rigidity. Other serious upgrades include roller bearings throughout, a four-cylinder IH engine with wet sleeves, full fenders for safety, optional front and back electric lights, an enclosed inch compartment, and new ergonomic considerations for the operator. A huge milestone was reached in January of 1928 when the company's 100,000th tractor came off the line. The unit construction throughout this machine made it easy to remove individual assemblies for components. This easy access layout saved hours of labor for the farmer or the dealer mechanic. These more powerful machines made it possible to pull larger and larger pieces of equipment like the McCormick Dairy Thresher. Cyrus the third, there were three Cyruses actually in the company. Cyrus the third once said that his father wanted his company to have a soul. 
Here's an example of the company reaching out to some of their customers in the time of need. The 1925 Tri-State Tornado that cut a path through Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana and killed 695 people also damaged homes, farms, and farm equipment. In a quick response, Harvester immediately made plans to ship new 1020 tractors to the area's hardest hit. Here are some of the tractors being unloaded in Owensville, Indiana, with the hope that this would prompt, this probability could save growing seasons for some of the local farmers. In 1928, again, engineers were trying to use a farm tractor as the basis for a crawler. Some serious engineering would be necessary before the idea became commercial reality. Much, it, uh, as much or more than any previous tractor, Harvester's 1530 opened up the country west of Chicago with its ability to break ground. The 1934 film, Our Daily Bread, romanticized this idea as seen in these stills. This 1931 ad features one of Ed Johnson's most important contributions to mechanized farming, the rear shaft PTO, first available on harvester tractors in 1918. This ability to transfer power to other devices has been the industry standard for decades. Anybody want to tell me the more important advancement for their rear PTO that came later? Anybody? Independent PTO, yes. The, the old PTOs ran with ground motion, right, which was not good if you pulled the brush cutter. That was a, a later advance. Following an antitrust consent decree in 1917, only one company, General Lyon, or former company dealership, was allowed for town. With this ruling, McCormick Dairy Brand was born. The first McCormick Dairy tractors first appeared in 1923. The name remained in use until 1949 in the U.S. and Canada. In Europe, the ruling did not apply, so McCormick and Deering Company, uh, Deering, continued doing business as two separate brands, as demonstrated by these two office buildings in France. This trade show in Germany is another example of the two separate brands under the Harvester banner. During the 1920s, Harvester had a hotbed of experimentation. Judging from this photo, the company was considering the idea of a steam power tractor on a much smaller scale than those currently on the market. This model designed by Mr. G.W. Engstrom was awarded a patent in 1928. Throughout the process of putting this original presentation together, Tom was looking for something to speak to the biological engineers of the island. He made this presentation to the American Society of Audible, Agricultural and Biological Engineers in Chicago about a month ago. The graphic artist in the back is creating a display panel about the different kinds of hay crops, while the man in front is working on one, of, uh, on one about manure as a valuable crop. He's illustrating the estimated production of each kind of farm animal. The company produced this series of brochures covering everything from canning and gardening to pistons and plowing. The company's Terry Holden was a well-respected agronomist. He is lecturing on the benefits of alfalfa. Some literature recently discovered by Sarah Tomac in the archives shows how the company offered farmers free building plans, specifications and materials lists so they could build their own structures, including a seven-room farmhouse, a machine shed, a general barn, a silo, and a poultry house. This elaborate undertaking demonstrates the kind of relationship the company wanted with its customers. The early formal years were some of the most important years in the company's history and set the stage for more than 50 years of progress. Before the excitement of the farm of Ed Johnson suffered the major failure of his illustration of the illustrious career, he designed something called the Motor Cultivator. Every machine that was purchased was returned and the problems could not be corrected. The rear engine was weighed more than a ton and made the machine very top heavy. The motor cultivator was dangerous and frequently flipped over. This photo helps explain Johnson's idea. With the, the motor in the rear, the operator had a perfect view of the work in front of him. This experimental machine is probably an early farm model prototype. The first farm model is considered by many to be the most important tractor in history. This is the machine that set the expectations for all tractors going forward. Deer quickly copied it a year later, and all other makers followed soon thereafter. In addition to all the work at the company's farm in Hinsdale, now Burberry is the company's process of testing prototypes with customers paid off. This all-purpose machine had everything, a manageable size, a small turning radius, 
high ground clearance, excellent visibility, and most importantly, as the first road contractor, the ability to cultivate. In development for years, prototypes were distributed to branch houses where they were tested by regional customers. After so many running hours, the parts were tested and proved as necessary. This listening to customers to pay played a big role in the success of the farm. After the disastrous release of the motor cultivator, IH quietly released the farm in many in far away Texas from the scrutiny of the Midwest farmer. The tractor's appearance startled everyone who saw it for the first time. No one considered it attractive. A farmer in Texas said, it's only as the devil, but if you don't want to buy one, you better stay off the seat. That's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> Farmers agreed that cultivating with Farmo was so much easier than working with a team of horses. More than any other product, Farmo put farm animals out of work on a global scale. In the 1930s, a Kansas IH leader took 400 horses in trade in one year before that practice was canceled. To meet the ever increasing demand for farm oil tractors, in 1926, the company built a new plant in Rock Island, Illinois. Here are some of the early farm oils in the plant. Here is an 806 on the line in the 1960s. And here are some of the new 2 plus 2 tractors being assembled in 1979. By 1938, the original farm oil lineup consisted of these four models. The regular, the F30, the F12, the F20, and the F14. This scenic portrait with some beautiful late afternoon sun features and F12 with a single front wheel. Engineers worked to continue to improve the farm oil. In 1930, after some experimentation, they added 10 degrees of camber to the front wheels. This move made steering smoother and easier. Later, with the letter series in 1939, the worm and separate gears were submerged in an oil bath, again easing the operator's ability to steer the tractor. With harvesters' invention of the row crop tractor, farmers had far more control over their crops. The ability to cultivate was the defining characteristic of the farm model. This capability distributed from all tractors that came before it. And it was the unique potential that started the movement to replace all work animals and mechanical power. This was only 23 short years after Harvey Swift suggested such a thing to the management team. This illustration is, the, is the, the featured visual on a poster created by the company to celebrate its 100th anniversary. It was sent to the Country Gentleman magazine subscribers in 1931. An excerpt from the text of the poster reads, The McCormick Deering Farm Hall, which is shown here at Cultivation, Four Rows of Corn, is the crowning achievement of the present era. era. This photo shows the complexity and heavy-duty nature of some of the front mounted implements. With the farm hall cultivating with implements in the front or the rear was not a problem. It is not a surprise that with the arrival of the tractor, the number of work animals decreased rapidly. The 26.5 million animals in 1915 was reduced to 4.5 million in 1960, which surprises me there were that many. Likewise, the number of tractors in 1915 was less than 30,000. It grew to 4.8 million by 1960. With the acquisition of the Parlin and Orlandorf, Orlandorf P&O, in 1919, Harvester acquired the best, longest running line of plows, the Little Wonder and the Little Genius. There were several little genius models, but the number eight was the most common. Across the 70,000 number eights were built. They ranged from 2.5 to, to 5 bottoms. Prior to World War II, they featured steel wheels, and after the war, they most came on rubber. The blue paint you see here is not a mistake. Blue was the replacement for red during the war, except because there was a shortage of red paint. The power lift introduced in 1931 was the company's answer to working with heavy implements long before the introduction of hydraulics. It was powered by the PTO with radio control tractors and put a series of demonstrations on at the Indiana State Fair. The crowds were amazed to see the tractor run and turn without any driver. A few years later, at the World's Fair in Chicago, known as the Century of Progress, the company had a dressed up version of the radio control tractor. The demonstrations drew long lines of spectators and even for a newsreel. Firestone used local meetings like this one to convince farmers that rubber tires were the future. With their aggressive education and sales approach, they were the market leader. 
After sending a team of engineers to Germany to, diesel, to view diesel technology, in 1933, the company built its first diesel engine. Only two years later, the company produced America's first diesel power fuel tractor, the WD-40. By the time Burke Benjamin's Farmball F-12 won the World Fork winner in production, it had been around in Burke Benjamin's head for 13 years. He'd also worked on the Farmall for years before it released in 1924. So, so he must have been a patient man. The corn picker was one of the implements he designed for Fortson while his services were on loan to Ford. At the time, he could not interest either Ford or his own boss at Harvester, Ed Johnson, to build the picker. Once in production, it was a success that moved the needle once more toward mechanized farming. In 1939, the hardworking but utilitarian Farmo was reborn as a sleek, modern machine. When Harvester was ready to modernize their line of tractors, they approached a man who was arguably the first and most famous industrial designer of the 20th century. Raymond Lowy was known for his work designing everything from toasters to locomotives. Lowy created a new kind of tractor with a letter series. They were modern and streamlined. And combined with Harvester's engineering, the letter series became the gold standard by which other tractors would be judged. Lowy also designed a new IH logo on the, on the train returning to New York after a meeting with his client in Chicago. It became one of the most identifiable brands in the world, joining the likes of Coca-Cola. Tom created a little cartoon version for those of you who have a hard time seeing the man on the tractor. I don't know how many knew this, but the IH logo is supposed to indicate a driver on a tractor. By the way, I was working for Harvester for probably 20 years before I was ever told that. But it really is a cool concept that that guy thought of, and he, he drew it on an app. So the bottom picture is Tom's cartoon of what that might look like. At the same time, uh, while Harvester had Lowy, Deere was working with an equally respected industrial designer named Henry Dreyfus. With a somewhat different sensibility, Dreyfus put a greater focus on the functional rather than the stylistic aspects of design. This slide shows three types of tractors. The distinctions made by Harvester's branding, row props for utility or standard models carried the McCormick Deary name, while the industrials carried the international name. By 1939, the Farmall name had transitioned from the name of a single model to a brand encompassing many models. First of the letter series to be released were the N and the H. These two models would dominate the world of farm tractors for more than 10 years. Also part of the letter series were the A and the B, introduced in 1954, and the C in 1948. A companion to the letter series was the small cub, which on its own was a sales superstar. The A, B, and cub shared a configuration with an offset seat that gave the operator a clear line of sight to the ground in front of him. The company called this cull division. It was inexpensive, lightweight, and simple to operate. It was popular everywhere and evolved over time, staying in production until 1964. Sold especially well in the South, where farms were typically smaller than in the South. This 1948 photo of the Louisville plant illustrates the popularity of farm halls. All the tractors in the center were cubs. Here's a model C cultivating between the rows. And here are the giants of the industry in action. Check out the production numbers. The model H, with more than 391,000 tractors sold, holds the world record for a single model. Harvest tractors of this era were designed to meet every possible need. Most tractors had adjustable rear tracks and some had adjustable at the front tracks as well. And then there were, there was the AB with more than 27 inches of ground clearance and the low boy that hugged the earth. During World War II, farming played a critical role in the war effort. Harvester dealer offered classes to the women left at home to run the family farm. They were taught to operate and maintain their farm home tractors. The first World's diesel power row crop tractor, the Farmall ND, played a pivotal role in bringing diesel power to mainstream farming. The cotton picker was one of Harvester's huge successes, and the delicate nature of the plant made the engineering an almost insurmountable. With years of persistence, the first cotton picker anywhere went into production in 1944. 
Sales of the cotton picker didn't really pick up until the 1950s. Harvester's unique design of the drums and the dockers was the heart of the picker's success. If you look carefully, you can see that these machines are fixed to the top of the tractor that was set up to run in reverse. In 1947, the company introduced the touch control product, bringing hydraulics to the farm tractor. With touch control, the operator could raise and lower implements weighing as much as 2,000 pounds. Uh, Tom stumbled on this picture of the experimental product. It was a flamethrower used to kill beans. It didn't really go into production. I don't think they considered it being too safe, even in that time. This is another weed control concept that uh, we had to do a double take we found it. It was an ultraviolet light weeding drill. They said to make sure you wear sunglasses when you operate this tractor. <laughs> that didn't go to production either. Uh, with the advancements of herbicides in the 70s, the need for cultivation was dramatically reduced or eliminated. Standard tractors like the W9, the diesel companion, the WD9, were the wheatland counterparts of the row crop tractors of the era. Released in 1954, the torque amplifier revolutionized transmission engineering. For the first time, farmers could shift the tractor between two gears, not only on the go, but also on the load, without having to use the clutch or throttle the engine down. When plowing, the TA gave farmers the ability to shift down, thereby generating more torque for hard spots in the field. It also generated massive parts sales for our dealers. <laughs> you guys that work on tractors know what I'm talking about. Farm drivers were especially popular on big farms in the northwest of Canada. The Super Letter Series with the incrementally improved versions of the earlier models, new hydraulics, disc brakes, 10 more horsepower, and stronger transmissions, bull gears, and axles. Power Street engineers developed something they called the two-point fast hitch that Vermont promised easy coupling with implements by simply backing into them. It was introduced in 1954, first appearing on a Super C. It was popular, but the competitors were all using the Ferguson three-point hitch developed by Harry Ferguson in 1939. The fast hitch used an ex external hydraulic cylinder and had no provisions for draft control. By 1961, the three-point hitch had become the industry standard and the fast hitch faded from use. The Electrol was a short-lived system co-developed by General Electric and Harvester. It essentially was used used the tractor engine and a generator to make electricity. Rural America was the last to get electric power, so this concept had its place. In an emergency, the electrol could generate power for the mill coolers or even the house. Power stream would love the hay bailer that was powered by electricity. The more interesting product was a device to electrocute insects at night in the field. Oversized bug tapper, basically. <laughs> Which I think would be popular today. Uh, the 100 series represents an incremental improvement on the Super Letter series. New here were some of the sheet metal changes, a different hydraulic system, and a new independent PTO. The updated 100 series introduced in 1956 was one more incremental step away from the original letter series. It included a new two-tone paint scheme and some changes to the hydraulic system. And like all new series, now it ranged from the small and lightweight machines to the larger powerful. In, this, in his research, Tom came across this paper prepared by the company engineers in 1956. It lists what they considered to be the company's first in tractor and farm business. And here they are. This is uh, the, the Reaper, the rear shaft PTO, the farm all tractor, the power takeoff operated combines, enclosed gear motor, power takeoff powered brain bed binder, single two row tractor mounted corn pickers. Chromic gearing, cotton picker, torque amplifier, PTO, power lift, floating auger for bailers, McCormick touch control, and the fast hitch. By the 50s, the demand for larger and more powerful tractors was accelerating. Harvester continued to innovate and compete, but in the, in the least, and at least one case, cut corners for, for disastrous results, and that was the 560 that some of you probably remember heard about. Farmers often operated on small margins. They were always looking for ways to cut costs. In the mid-50s, farmers began converting their gas tank tractors to liquefied propane or LP gas. Tractor makers, including Harvester, jumped on the trend. Most models at the time were sold with an LP option. During the 60s, LP gas fell out of favor with the introduction of the diesel tractor. The 1640 series tractors were introduced in 1958. This series offered a full complement of tractors, as you can see here, both row crop and standard. 
The introduction of the 60 series, the 56460, was an event like nothing before. It was held at the company's test farm in Hinsdale, Illinois. An estimated 12,000 dealers attended from over 25 countries. There's a videotape. If you punch it in on YouTube, you can see the videotape of that event in Hinsdale in 
really was a better engine than the, the V8. But this tractor is very popular. Even today, you, it's hard to find one. If you do find one, you're going to pay a lot of money for it. <laughs> They're expensive. Used a DV550 ammunition engine. While the name is not catchy, the 468 was the tractor version of the muscle cars of the day. A Chevelle, a GTO, or maybe a Camaro. The Super Deluxe Cab was a comfortable state-of-the-art, fully insulated and vibration-free workspace. The heater blower canister, or, uh, the heater blower and roof ventilator added to these comforts. And the ergonomics of the flat, clearway deck and hip level controls offered ideal environment for the operator, even on the longest days. Near the end of the run of the 66 series, Harvest was looking for a little something to bring attention to these tractors and help dealers sell off their remaining inventory. At the same time, Mr. Greg Montgomery joined the IH design team. He recently worked at Ford where he created some of the successful graphics for pickup trucks. Montgomery was given the assignment to develop the almost legendary Black Stripe series. He also tweaked the tractor's red to a slightly darker shade. His work accomplished intended results in more. The development of the actual combine stands at the top of the company's list of innovations with Reaper and the Farmer. This machine was in the works for 65 years, but unlike the cotton picker, many of the steps in the development were manufactured and sold. While most of these steps were incremental, the axle flow technology was the game changer. Gary Wells pictured in this middle shot uh, is the was the head of the large team of engineers who created the first rotary type combine, a technology that is still in use today. Do you anything about Gary Wells? Gary is in Farmers. Yes. The very first one that we'll all find and build. That would be the whole line out there. Oh, it's out here? Yeah, out here. The very first one we had built. What model? 1460. 60. I was a mechanic there. Is that right? At the East Moline plant? Excuse me? At you at the East Moline plant? Where, where did you work on it? Where was that? It came to the International Park. We were in Alpha, Illinois, Seoul, Dubai. Uh, 
the two on the left are not those that are Those are traditional uh, crab steer tractors that articulated what's on the left. They were all uh, uh, They weren't staggered. Right, they were not staggered. I don't know who said that, but you're right. Uh, with everything on the line, Harps are set out to produce the tractor engineers and farmers alike only dreamed about. The 50 series tractors were completely new from the ground up. There were no carryover parts, but the focus on high technology and quality, the company invested more than $200 million to bring these tractors to production. Bob Oliver's story, oh, I, I was down, no, I'm like Dan there. One day I got a call, I was at the Hanso Park Sports Center, and Bob Oliver was the chief guy for these tractors. He said, you want to, would you like to see the tractor? And I said, yes, I would. He said, well, go to the bathroom before you go, because when you see it, you're going to pee your pants. <laughs> and he had it in the engineering center. And it is, I, I can't, I, I still can't, but when I saw it, I thought, what an amazing thing we had done. You know, the single tri-shift, the new cab, and it was the reverse fan flow. It was a cool tractor. Uh, we spared no expense. The commission forced to design the cab for these models. The prototypes were subjected to 50,000 hours of field testing seven years of retooling and reconfiguring to repair the plants for these machines. The new tractors are part of Harvester's meaningful competitive advantage program and designed to regain some market share from Deere, which Deere was kicking our ass at that time, excuse my friends. It's easy to see the styling of Ray McMunder's Black Stripe series influence on these machines, but make no mistake, the engineering of the 50 series was entirely new. Like the 50 series itself, the STS single tri-ship transmission was also new from the ground up. It was fully synchronized with 18 speeds forward and 6 in reverse. The STS proved to be a hit with farmers when introduced in 1982 and was used in the 50, 52, 54 EA tractors. The 2 plus 2 series probably the most unique tractor in the company's history. Uh, The resulting series of these machines were the world's first articulated row crop tractor. The, tra the tractor, the cab was located in the rear path behind the pivot where the added weight helped the traction. In, design, in designing these tractors, engineers took parts from other tractors and from the Huff Division's wheel loader. The final drives came from two 1066 tractors. They used the transfer case from the 4166. The resulting tractor had great traction and less compaction. It also had several small turning radius for a machine of its size. If you remember, Bud Mule is no longer with us, God bless his soul. But Bud, in the last meeting, I think, made a presentation. This was his favorite tractor. He really swore by the 2 plus 2. Replacement models were added only two years later, and all these machines drew enough attention to garner nicknames. The Ant Eater was the most common on the US. The first installment of the 2 plus 2s were introduced in 1984. These Super 70 tractors were short-lived with the sale of the Ag Division coming not long after the introduction. I think there were like 12 or 18 of these made, and they're available for sale at a very, very high dollar amount. The company has many concept vehicles. I'm going to show you some of those here today that never came into production. In the 50, in the 60s, Harvester Solar Division in San Diego was working on a gas turbine tractor and truck. Neither went into production. It wasn't the high piercing steel engine or the serious challenges of gearing down. The but it was the fuel economy. It was very inefficient. This tractor is in the Smithsonian Institution in Japan, Washington, D.C. It's an I'd like to have a tractor. And the scout was so popular it looks like the ag engineers were hoping to get in on the phrase. So you can see they had this design with the, looks like a crane drill. This truck like machine appears to have four wheel steering and seems fairly viable. The Space Age combine looks massive. I think the idea is that it runs on a wide way, runs the wide way through the field and then narrow way on the road, which by the way doesn't seem like a bad idea to me. I think uh, I see a combine and a bailer in the left image and a rear engine tractor with the ground level iron cockpit on the right image. And finally, there was a highly secretive group in the 70s and early 80s staff with PhDs taking on conceptual projects. This is only one we know about, the idea of protein extraction, a process that does not involve traditional harvesting. Company President Roots McCormick repeatedly said that if the Reaper replaced seven farmhands, that the Axiable Combine replaced 200 workers, how many could this protein extraction process replace? Now this is Tom's favorite pop culture. 
Countries from around the world have honored our trackers and their heritage with postage stamps. Check these out. In addition to the U.S., there's a Mexico, Mongolia, Denmark, and Iceland.